Hello and welcome back. This video will discuss machine vision. So in this video, what you are watching is the robot using machine vision assisted picking to allow the, the gripper to find that interior profile so that it can grab each of those gears correctly. The advantage to this, as you can see, is the gears aren't necessarily in any specific order other than a single layer at a time. And that's really a lot of the reason we use machine vision other than as a go-no-go -go type of solution. It allows for this flexibility in part location. It allows the robot to find the part, find a feature on the part. Uh, the parts can be in a any order that you really want them to come into, and they don't really have to even be flat. They can be stacked and some other things, but a lot of the times uh, it'll just be more of a what rotation is it or, or something along those lines because the more rotations that the part can be at uh, significantly compl complicates the, the machine vision, but it does allow for that. A lot of the times... Companies won't even use the, the vision for finding the part, but instead as advanced quality assurance uh, tools because it's able to do fairly high precision, accurate, very, very repeatable measurements. As long as the lighting relative to the part remains the same, I can throw the same part under the camera a hundred times and get the exact same answer. Unfortunately, a lot of the times if you hand a person a pair of calipers or a ruler over a hundred times, you're going to get a variation on what they perceive to be the correct measurement. Uh, a lot of times you can also use machine vision for things like confirming the orientation of a part. Think about uh, computer chips, which have little notches or half moons or something along those lines in, an, in them at one end or in one corner. And if you want to confirm that the part was located and placed correctly, you could use machine vision to do that so that you don't move a part that has a known bad component in, in it uh, further down line. Some of the terms that you will hear in the following videos are, are listed here. Uh, depth of field, uh, field of view. I'm going to talk more about depth of field in a minute. Field of view is how big of an area can the camera see? Uh, aperture, I'm going to talk about in a few minutes as well. It, it ties actually into depth of field. You can see on the two lenses to the right that they are both 400 millimeters in terms of magnification, but the top one has an F of 2.8 and a diameter of 6.4 inches, whereas the 5.6 lens below only has a diameter of 3.5 inches. The reason for this is that the smaller F number results in an ability to collect more light and as you can imagine, the more light that is getting through, the larger the opening has to be. Depending on who you talk to, you'll hear the term optics used a lot. This is nothing more than a fancy sounding word for the lens that is on the camera. Uh, my hobbies and background include photography. And so as a result of that, I think in terms of traditional photography, but a lot, if not all, of the rules in traditional photography apply to machine vision as well as uh, to videography, which I've started playing with as well. You'll hear people talk about zoom and telephoto lenses. Zoom gets to the idea of a lens that is adjustable, whereas telephoto is a fixed magnification. Lighting is everything in cameras and machine vision and taking pictures in general. And you can use ambient or flood lighting, which is just the general lighting you see around a, uh, an area. Uh, if you walk into a room, that light that you see is ambient light. If you walk into a room with a window and no lights on, the outside light is the ambient light. Uh, alternatively, and quite often in machine vision specifically, you're going to want a strobe. It's a flash. And the reason you want that flash is it will freeze frame to a degree the motion of a part that's physically moving. And so I don't know if, if any of you were in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or Explorers or anything where you're running around at night during a rainstorm, during a thunderstorm, 
Um, I had a, an amusing childhood, I guess, and I've been known to do that. But if you're running through a storm or, or just watch a video of a, um, a horror movie where they have the characters running through a storm with lightning, you'll notice whenever that lightning flashes, you sort of get a freeze frame effect of the surroundings. That's what the strobe does, and that's why you want to use it. If my parts are moving, I don't want to worry about any blur or smearing of the image to the camera, and so I would use that strobe to solve that problem. Aperture is the diameter of the opening on the camera. Uh, aperture gets into a whole lot of other issues, but where it plays a big role and the reason you need to worry about it is because it, Im because it impacts the depth of field. And so the depth of field, uh, the pictures you can see here, because aperture is an inverse relationship, and don't worry about that, uh, but if I have a, a low aperture number, the f1.8 1, 1 on the left, you'll notice that the monkey in the background is out of focus, whereas as I increase the f number uh, from 4 to 8, the monkey in the background becomes more and more in focus. And depending on what type of picture you want and what you're trying to achieve with that picture, you may need a large depth of field and you may want a lot of your picture to be in focus and have crisp, sharp edges. But a lot of the times in machine vision, you only want a surface to be in focus or a specific area and you don't want the background in focus because it makes it harder for the machine vision to capture and identify edges and features and what you're trying to deal with. And so generally you want a wide aperture which gives you a narrow depth of field and that short range that is in focus. And so here's a picture I took years ago. Uh, I was at a, uh, a sailing event and you'll notice that the flags in the foreground are as just in focus as the open umbrella and the little light green tree and, and even to a degree the trees in the background. And those trees in the background were probably 20 or 30 feet, maybe more away, yet all of that was in focus. That's because I have a long depth of field and my aperture was small, so I had a high F number. Conversely, this is one of my cats, and as you can tell, he is in focus. Everything behind him is very, very, very much out of focus. Uh, you'll hear people sometimes use the term soft focus uh, for something in the background, but that's the way it's set up. So that if I wanted to trace the outline of the cat, it, even though the coloring of the cat and the background are kind of close, the system has a chance of, of making that, uh, finding that edge because there's a sharp edge, a rel relatively sharp edge to where the cat is. Uh, telecentric lenses are a special type of lens that a lot of times are used in machine vision. The downside to them, they are very, very expensive. And they, they act something like a, a telephoto lens because they're fixed focus generally or fixed uh, magnification size. And what they do is they take the light rays and they act kind of like a pinhole camera. If you know what that is, don't worry if you don't. But it basically makes the light rays more parallel than they would in a normal lens. And what this does is it takes an image like this where... That pipe is actually straight that we're looking through. And you can see the front edge, but you can also see the back edge. And it looks like the far end of that pipe is a smaller diameter. In reality, it's not. But because of how the light rays move through the lens, you get this effect. If I took the same picture with the same camera at the same location with the telecentric lens, however, you'll notice the pipe now looks straight. And so... If I'm taking the picture of a hole in a part, I have to be careful, depending on how thick that part is, of making sure that I have a way to ensure that the dimension I'm measuring is the one I want, which is probably the one on top. And if I'm looking for 
occurrences where there's a taper in that hole that I want to make sure I know that the taper is caused by the hole itself and not the lens of the camera. Hopefully that makes sense. I mentioned at the beginning of the video, lighting really is everything in photography. And one of the things that you can do with careful and well-planned and conceived lighting around your, your target, you can hide things that you don't want to see, or you could accidentally hide things that you do want to see. And so the upper left picture, and these are all computer renderings uh, in AutoCAD of the same part, but with different lights uh, enabled and disabled. The part on the top, it pretty much looks like it's just a flat piece, and maybe you got a little bit of a shadow on the top side of it, but you've got a clear hole in it, and that's it. If we look at the lower right picture, however, you'll notice that there is a bright white top surface, but there are medium gray shadows and then a black background. And the way I did that, those two shots, was, as you can see, how they're labeled. I have all the lights turned on in the upper left, and on the lower right, I only have a light pointing straight down from over the part. You may have heard people talk about ring lights. Um, and I, I think in some of the videos you're going to watch next, there are references to ring lights. <clears throat> what these do is allow the light source to almost come from directly at where the camera exists. And that will give you this top light effect. It will soften or remove any imperfections in the top surface of the part. But if all I care about is the profile of the part or, or what the, uh, the top edge looks like, then this is a way to get that. Now, if I only care about the bottom profile, I could do the all lighting that you see in the upper left, or I can do what's called backlighting. And I know that one of the videos that you'll be watching next gets into that. I can turn on and off uh, left, lower right, upper right features or lights and hide or accentuate the, the cutout feature that you see in the upper middle image. By turning on that upper right light, I wash out that entire area. And so it looks like that, that cutout isn't there. And if it's supposed to be there, that would probably be the worst way to light it. Whereas coming from the left or the, the lower well, lower right's okay. Maybe lower left would be even better. I would probably be able to better see whether or not that feature is there. And so there are, in addition to standard part location for picking and, and metrology, there are some other options and solutions out there that people have implemented vision for. One of them is shown here, and this was from a company in Ohio called Rixan. And what they did is they put a machine vision camera on a parts feeder, and this allows them to load two or three different types of parts that are similar, but then have the robot go and pick the part it needs. Uh, it means that the parts feeder is less constrained, and I don't necessarily have to have a single parts feeder or multiple parts feeders for each single part, but I can have a single parts feeder for multiple similar parts that are about the sh same shape and size. As I mentioned, quite often people will use this for metrology, for measuring parts. And so this is a screen capture of a system I used to have years ago. And I'm just measuring the outside diameter of that part. And apparently it is approximately 29 and a half millimeters in width. Some other terms you're gonna run across when dealing with machine vision are the terms area imager versus line scan. And so an area imager is nothing more than a digital camera. At the end of the day, that's all it is. It has an X and a Y axis and pixels that make up a matrix. Whereas a line scan system is a single line of pixels. And there is something that, that allows for the system to move. And what it will do, it knows how far it moved with each uh, increment that it's moved and it's able to take the picture, the single line picture 
and then stack them together to create a traditional two-dimensional picture. Uh, this is used a lot in high-speed scenarios where I have something moving at an extremely high rate past the camera, and I don't necessarily want to have to wait for the camera to capture the X and Y data. I only barely have time to capture one, the X data and really think about all of the videos you may have seen of printing for newspapers where they've got these great big machines and the images of the picture is running f or images of the newspaper are running by at, at a phenomenal rate. They would put a line scan system for machine vision on that so that they know how far the paper has moved per um, pulse in, in the system and it's able to then capture that edge or that line of, of pixels and create an entire image as it goes. And then I already mentioned strobing. Here's another example of how companies may implement a, a machine sy vision system. And what they're doing is this is a backlight and they're taking a picture of this shape here and they're looking for this black ring here and that black ring there, which are O-rings in this case. And it's able to say, hey, I don't see the bump where the O-ring should be, or I do see the bump where the O-ring should be. And it can make a decision as to whether the part is good or bad based on that. In this picture, or these pictures, excuse me, they are measuring the pitch on the coils, as an example. And they're measuring, I don't know what, on the upper right image. But they're checking for different dimensions, thread dimensions probably. And then the lower right is looking at this diameter or this arc and checking on the location of that relative to the center of the circle and the location of that arc and are these circles where they belong and so it's able to say hey is that there is that there is the part correct all right that's it for now thanks for watching